Thank you. So the brain is really, really, really freaking cool. It is the most complex system in the known universe. You've got over 80 billion neurons forming over 100 trillion synapses. When they all fire properly together, they make you, you. But I don't need to explain to anybody in this room that the brain is cool. If you're attending a TEDx talk, you obviously value the sciences. But neuroscience today is where chemistry was in 1650. That's actually a very exciting prospect. It means we have so much left to learn. And we're going to have to move forward out of necessity, since one in five of us will come down with a neurological disorder at some point in our lives. Whether it's stroke, epilepsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, these diseases place an enormous burden on society. So to have a hope at actually finding effective treatments or even cures for these diseases, we're going to need more scientists. And we're going to need to get the public on board. But neuroscience isn't really taught to young students. And the main argument for this is that the equipment is really expensive, and it's just an inaccessible topic for people who don't have a foundation in biology. But I disagree. So what ends up happening is that students don't get ex exposed to how amazing this field is until they're already in college or grad school. That's an issue. I think we need to be reaching back earlier in students' educations and showing them how cool this field is. So how do we open up this field? And how do we make it more accessible to young students as well as just anybody who's interested? Well, I think the answer lies in the open science movement. Now, open science, that's a term maybe some of you have heard. And it's a big umbrella term. It covers a lot. It's kind of poorly defined. But I think you can break it down into four categories. Um, the most kind of prevalent term you hear related to open science is open publications. If you find something interesting out about the natural world, you can share it in an open journal like PLOS One. And anybody can access it for free. There's no paywall involved. And a lot of major journals are switching to this model. I think that's fantastic. Peripheral to the idea of the actual like, publications is the idea of open data. As groups are collecting data, they're sharing it freely and openly online. They're verifying it. And this encourages global cooperation. And the best example I can think of is the Human Genome Project. Even before the internet really kind of hit it big, the, op there were groups around the world that were sharing data as it was collected openly and freely on the internet. And so the whole global community was plugged in as the project moved forward. These two things are enormous successes in open science. But there's two areas I think we need improvement on. Number one is the push to make the actual methods open source, where if you, let's say you write a program to analyze data, or you build something physical to carry out an experiment, we need to make the actual methods themselves open to the public. We need to encourage participation and replication. And finally, we have open education. This is the idea of breaking down the systematic barriers that prevent certain groups of students from actually accessing certain fields for one reason or another. And I think the most salient example of an inaccessible field right now is neuroscience. So how do we fix that? Well, I worked at a company called Backyard Brains. Maybe some of, you, some of the people have heard of this, but we make low cost, open source, uh, we call it DIY, do it yourself, neuroscience tools. Um, these are more accessible to students, to teachers, and just anybody who's curious about seeing the brain in action. I think the best way to sum up what Backyard Brains is all about is my favorite development, the spiker box. So you see on that cork board up there, there's uh, an insect leg. We put two electrodes in. And when you brush the sensory fibers on the edge of the insect leg, you actually see action potentials on a smartphone, a tablet, or any other device you have. And action potentials are the fundamental language of how neurons communicate with each other. And so for a child to see one of these on a screen, like being produced by a living system makes a lot more sense than if I were to just draw one on a, on a whiteboard. Um, we have a real interest also from tinkerers and makers and hardware hackers, because all the schematics and all the source code are available for free online. And so it's not that we're selling products. We really encourage people to build them themselves and hack together their own experiment and modify it how they want and share it with the world. And that is the true spirit of open science. So enough with the theoretics. I have a live demo of some of our technology. 
Uh, I need a volunteer. I need one volunteer right now. Give him a round of applause. All right. All right, so what's your name? Vincent. Vincent, nice to meet you. All right, we're going to get to know you really well. Uh, so I need you to roll up your sleeve, if that's all right. Maybe I should have picked someone with like, all right. just uh, yeah, like your, one of your, yeah. All right, I actually need to see kind of this part. Yeah. I know. It's all right, don't plan for these things. Um, well, while he's getting ready, uh, what we're going to do is talk about the ulnar nerve. So when your brain sends a signal down out of your motor, motor cortex, down your spine, and into your arm, it synapses onto the muscle. And we can actually listen to the signal that your brain is talking to your muscle with. And it's, since the ulnar nerve is very close to the skin, we can actually take that electrical impulse, amplify it, and then show it on a screen. So we're going to do that right now. So I'm going to put a reference electrode on the back of your hand. Thank you. We're going to put two more kind of on this area. So on the inside. Yeah. One there. And one here. All right, so can you uh, actually step kind of over here? Awesome. So I'm going to plug you in here. You're not going to feel anything. Don't worry. So uh, just uh, on the back there, reference electrode. And one and two. All right. So let me open up the iPad here. Uh, plug this in. All right, so everybody can kind of see that. All right, so what I want you to do is with your arm out, just basically as, like you're curling something, just do that. Everybody see that? So that's what we call EMG, electromyography. I'll hold it up for people. So just do it a few more times so people can see. So as he's flexing, his brain is sending a real signal down to his arm, and we're listening to that. Now, what's even cooler is if I set a threshold here, uh, now all I want to do is kind of hold it in a flex position. What you see there is we've isolated one action potential, the fundamental language I talked about earlier that the brain talks to things with. That's coming from your real body. Um, now, this is kind of cool in a theoretical sense, but we can actually do something with this signal. All right, you can relax, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Just show off, yeah. Um, so what, what we can actually do requires a second volunteer. Um, let's go with you. Yeah, yeah. All righty. So give him a round of applause, a big round of applause. <laughs> you don't know what you signed up for. All right, so what's your name? Gary. Gary, nice to meet you. All right, so Gary, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take the signal coming out of Vincent's arm. We're going to copy it and send it into your arm in real time. And so when your brain is going to tell your arm to move, your arm will move. <laughs> All right, it's a, it's a little spacey, but it'll make sense. All right, so what we're going to do is the same thing. Uh, we're going to put some electrodes on your arm, uh, the one without the watch, ideally. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're about to lose your free will, so it is going to feel a little weird. So, uh, alrighty. So I'm going to hook you up here to our amplifier. Um, anybody in the medical field, this is just a, a TENS unit that we're using, except we're playing a signal from his brain into it. So I'm going to connect this here, put on our live feed again. All right, so now what you're going to do every now and then, with some spacing in between, is you're just going to kind of flick your wrist. Just like that? All right. So every now and then, just kind of pull it up and, yeah. All right. Ready to go? Are you ready to lose your free will? All right. So I'm turning on the device. And you're, I'm going to turn the gain up very slowly. So you're actually going to kind of look that way. Keep your arm where it is, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page here. Feel anything? Turn it up a little more. Oh, saw a finger move. Again? All right, so there's one more time for the audience. <laughs> one more time. All right, you've had enough, I'm sure. One more time, maybe. All right. <laughs> all right, so, all right, that's enough. All right, it's off now. <laughs> all right, so give him a round of applause, guys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Uh, you can keep those as souvenirs, but they're really cheap, so just take them off. Uh, all right, so audience members. I want you to take a pause. Imagine you're 10 years old and you've just seen that. Think about how excited you'd be. And believe me, when kids see a demonstration like this, they all want to go home and become neuroscientists. And that's really the point, is I want everybody who is interested in how the brain works to be able to do this kind of demonstrations or even their own research on their own time, and they don't need a grant to do it. 
And so I think if we can do that, I think if we can get more children interested in this field at a young age, then we're going to ignite a new era of scientific curiosity, and we're going to make discoveries we never even imagined. Thank you.